episode 234. Welcome to Data Skeptic, a podcast about data science and fake news from an algorithmic perspective. Here's your host, Kyle Polich. All right, well, our topic for tonight, Linda, is false discovery rates. So to get into that, we should talk about statistical testing and how science is conducted in an empirical way. Do you know much about clinical trials and stuff? Your dad worked on some of this. Uh, my dad worked for pharmacy companies, but I didn't ask him about the trials or how it works. So I don't know anything about this. Uh, let's say there's like a new drug that's going to come on the market. Obviously, you want to know, does it work? You also want to know, is it safe and all these kinds of things. And the only good way to answer those questions is with statistics. You know, you could give people a placebo, a sugar pill, and say, oh, did it make you feel better? Technically, people should always say no, because a placebo should have no effect, but some people are going to say yes. So for a drug to be real, it has to have an efficacy that is measurable greater than chance would allow. So if, you know, just by random chance, people reported getting better, then that's not a useful drug. Okay, so it needs to be not random. Yeah, the result has to be statistically significant. How do you determine statistical significance? First thing is you divide all the people up into two groups or maybe more groups. And then you basically give one of them a real treatment and one of them a fake treatment or a placebo or a sham or something like that. Essentially, you need it to be, if you can, double blinded. The people and the administers of the treatment, neither of them know who's in the test group and who's in the control group. So it's blind? Yeah, double blind is the important part. Double blind. So not only is the patient blinded, but the doctor giving the treatment is also blinded. That way there's no funny business, right? So they're not treating each group different. They are, yeah. One group is getting a proposed treatment that's real, and the other group is getting something that is known to not work, like a sugar pill. But the people administering it, they know because they're administering the placebo. No, that's the thing. The exact mechanisms are going to vary, but let's just do a hypothetical and say there's like a doctor who's going to bring you the pill to take. The doctor doesn't know which pill you're getting. They just know your ID number and they get you know the pill that, that's assigned to you. Only the analyst after the fact knows which group you were in. Do you think that means the drug has to outwardly look the same? Yes, it does. Yeah. In fact, this is kind of a problem Um, in certain cases, like with fake medicine. Sometimes it's hard to come up with a placebo version of it. But yeah, it's very important that if there's like, let's say a pill, the real medicine looks identical to the fake medicine. So no one can tell. But what about taste? You can't really make medicine taste the same as a placebo. Um, I think you can. Like, obviously, I'm not an expert in this area, but when you give the pill, like pills, first of all, don't have much of a taste. And if they do, you can probably apply the taste to the placebo version as well, even though it has no active ingredient in it. Well, I remember I read some study where they fed someone just like sugar water, and then they fed the real medicine group some other water. So, I mean, you might be able to tell. Yeah, that's a problem in certain cases. Like, yes, you have to be very careful of your protocols and stuff and make sure that you have actually isolated it so you don't accidentally unblind the study. That's the challenge of control trials. If you have one mechanism, like we think that this certain molecule will help people with this certain ailment, then the test is kind of straightforward. It's, you know, test if that particular compound or mechanism actually work. But a lot of times what happens, especially in the big data world, is we might look for a variety of possible causes. So let's switch now to more of a digital example. And let's say we're going to do something on some very highly trafficked website. We want to look and see what makes a first-time customer buy a product on their first visit to a site, right? That's a good situation new customer, you spent some money to acquire them. If they buy right away, that tells you you're doing a good job. Okay. Yeah. What do you think usually happens? Do customers, obviously it varies by business to business, but do you think most people are able to acquire a customer and convert them on the same day? I'm sure it depends on the business model, but when you say most people, are they able to convert anyone on the first day? I'm sure anyone, they can convert probably someone, but I would assume it's hard and challenging. Probably so. It depends on the business, obviously. Like, a restaurant, you go and you order, you get your food, it's over and done with. But I don't know, hiring a new accountant, for example, 
It's a multi-stage process, a lot of considerations to be made and a lot of evaluations to do. Sticking to our web domain example, though, if we're looking for what are the features of good customers, you know, who stays long term and stuff like that, you can study lots of independent variables, even like frivolous things like do people who use Chrome, are they better customers than people who use Safari or who knows what? Because there's so much data and you can track it all, you can literally do hundreds, maybe thousands or millions of independent tests to say, like, does this have an effect? But what do you suppose happens if you do too many experiments? On the same segment of people? Sure. Well, they could become overly saturated and might not be actually reacting in the way where you could use the evidence in other places. Tell me more about what you mean. Well, you're saying you're running too many experiments on the same group of people. Are you saying at the same time, so it's even hard to see what the results and where they came from? Yeah, essentially. Well, let's look at the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is where there's some lazy analyst and they have a demanding boss that says, we have to find something. (laughs) And if you look long enough, there will be something. Maybe it's that uh, people with Hotmail accounts purchase more than people who don't have Hotmail. There will always be some spurious correlation you can find if you look hard enough. So you're saying people want to manipulate data? Well, yeah, there are some people who do want to manipulate data and lie with data, but uh, I don't think we have to even think that nefarious. There are just cases where people don't understand how to control for multiple comparisons, and they keep slicing and dicing the data. There's a famous quote here, something about uh, if you torture the data long enough, it will eventually tell you you whatever you want it to say. And you believe that? Yeah, yeah, it's very true. And this gets down to the statistics now. If you don't set up some sort of proper statistical trial, you just try one thing after another, or you try, you know, dozens or hundreds of possible conditional variables, then something just by chance is going to click. If you do one simple test, like let's say you have a drug to test, presumably the reason you're going to test the drug is because there's some mechanism. You know, you don't go in and say, hey, let's find people with pancreatic cancer and let's make them eat Big Macs with curry powder on them because maybe that'll cure it. There's just no connection between the Big Macs and the cancer. But if you said, hey, we're, we're going to give you know, this certain specific treatment that's going to block this receptor, if there's some plausible mechanism, then you can go in and say, well, we're going to test that that mechanism is real. And that's the best kind of trial. But sometimes you just don't know. And it's like, let's try a lot of stuff and see what sticks. So you're trying different variables to see if it has an impact? Yeah. And lots of data scientists do this. It's very different from bench science because you have access to all the data. So you can try different slices and dices, you know, see, oh, what is uh, maybe people on mobile are different than desktop. Sure. That's very plausible. But if you check it and it turns out to have no correlation What you're actually forgetting to do is to kind of recognize that like, okay, you tested against one variable and you found nothing. If you go and test another variable next and you keep testing and testing until something works, well, just by chance, eventually something's going to work. Statistical tests never tell you yes or no. They just tell you if there's an effect with some confidence. So a lot of like the textbook statistics you learn in school will tell you to use this Uh, p-value of 0.05 so that there's basically it says that the result only has less than a five percent chance of happening by random you said 0.05 is five percent chance isn't that 0.05 yeah it'd be 0.05 okay so that's if you use that standard which kind of like every undergrad statistician student will do it means that yeah 95 percent of the time you're going to come to the right result But 5% of the time, you may arrive at a conclusion which appears to be supported by the data, but is actually due to chance. So 5% of the time, there seems to be something related, but it's chance. Um, Or it could be, right? Like maybe you run a drug trial and you say, hey, we're going to give this particular pill to a bunch of people and hopefully it'll help their headaches. If you have a proper double-blind trial and there's no effect then you should see the same improvement in the test in the control group. And you'd be like, oh, there's no difference here. Clearly the drug doesn't work. But if you test enough drugs, eventually, just by chance, it will so happen that a lot of people who got the drug will report positive effects, even though it's just kind of a, a noisy result. It, doesn't, it wasn't really caused by the mechanism of the drug. It was just the, the luck of the dice, if you will. Yeah, makes sense. 
So the historical, or I don't know if historical is the right word, but for a long time the way people dealt with this was they would apply something called the Bonferroni correction. And what the Bonferroni correction does, we talked about this a long, long time ago. We did an episode on this, but to refresh people's memory, it's the idea that you change the threshold of acceptance criteria. You don't say 0.05 is my p-value to accept. If you're going to test a bunch of different variables, you raise the standard of evidence with the Bonferroni correction. You say, I must see a result that is statistically significant to a higher level. Maybe 0.01 you know, is the level you're going to look for if you perform enough tests. And the more tests you check, the higher the standard of evidence you have to establish. So Bonferroni is really good because you don't get any false positives. You're getting stricter and stricter, so you don't accidentally you know, think something is real when it's not. So people tried to find a way in the middle to better deal with this problem of multiple comparisons. Listeners, I want to remind you about the Great Courses Plus. I know you know about them. You've probably heard your friends talking about their excellent courses. I want to feature one for this week, and that's Mathematics of Games and Puzzles. It's taught by Professor Arthur T. Benjamin of Harvey Mudd College. Twelve lectures, 45 minutes each. Great for a commute, even better for a flight. You can download all the lectures to your device for offline viewing, in case there's no Wi-Fi on that flight. Or heck, who can stream video efficiently on most connections? I love the offline sync through the app. Well, let's talk more about this course. Now, you already know, games are very mathematical. At one extreme, you've got games like chess and Go, fully deterministic games. Games that machines now play better than humans. We've talked about Sudoku on the show before. Our treatment was one about computational complexity. In the mathematics of games and puzzles, you'll get exposed more to the strategy and the structure of that game. They're going to do the Rubik's Cube, some really good group theory stuff there, impossibility puzzles, and of course, probabilistic games, games of chance, how to wager, play blackjack, the art of bluffing and poker and all these sorts of things. There's two worlds to gaming in my mind, the probabilistic and the deterministic, and you're going to get both sides of that coin. To sign up for this or check out any of the other courses they've got, courses in robotics, mathematics, economics, history, even learn a new language. There's a vast library for you to choose from at The Great Courses Plus, and you'll get unlimited access to stream their entire library. Watch or listen anytime with The Great Courses Plus app, and here's the offer I've got for you today. I know you're going to love The Great Courses Plus just as much as we do, and as a data skeptic listener, you can enjoy Mathematics of Games and Puzzles and any of the other lectures for free. Start your free trial today by going to this special URL. You ready? Let's see those thumbs moving. TheGreatCoursesPlus.com slash data. That's TheGreatCoursesPlus.com slash data. Multiple comparisons. So take me back to what do you mean? I thought you just meant they're raising the standard of what they're going to say fits into a finding. Yeah, that's if you use the Bonferroni correction which works in certain situations. Um, one of our early guests on the show who worked on a lot of genetics data said, oh, we use the Bonferroni correction. And when I asked her, you know, isn't very strict, she was like, yeah, but we have huge sample sizes. So it's easy for us to achieve statistical significance. But in other cases, you might not have huge data sets. And so there's a, a family of techniques called false discovery rates. And uh, finally, we're getting to our topic for today, false discovery rates. This is like kind of an alternative method to the Bonferroni correction. It basically says, let's just control for the number of errors we might get. If we do a bunch of tests, yeah, some of them are going to be spuriously positive. But as long as we have a low rate of which we see spuriously positive things, we can be happy. So what are spurious findings? A spurious finding is one that appears to be supported by the data, but is not generalizable. Like what? That would be like um, maybe you could be studying car crashes and you could say, oh, uh, people that have iPhones, they got more accidents than people that have Android. That, that's a plausible mechanism, right? Maybe there's something about the iPhone that you know notifies people in a certain way and it's more distracting and there's more drivers that therefore get in accidents. I don't think that that's true. Just you know, hypothetically, it's, it's not impossible. It could be that iPhone people get in accidents more often. 
Or that could just correlate. Maybe, you know, the people who choose to buy iPhones also choose to drive more erratically, which again, it would just, it would be correlation, not causation, but it would be real in the data. If you look at enough variables, you know, maybe you look at what type of phone they have. You could look at what radio station they were listening to. You could look at whether or not they were wearing sunglasses or had the visor open or had the sunroof open. If you look at enough variables in some data sets, you will find something that correlates. And then you'll be like, aha, people that have sunroofs, they get more car accidents. And, and your statistics will tell that story. But obviously, or I don't want to say obviously, but one would assume that a sunroof really is not related at all to the rate of accidents. That makes sense. But I don't understand if the data is showing this. And then the person interpreting the data wants to interpret it in maybe a not solid way. How do you actually know that it's not the best interpretation of the data, the optimum finding? Well, yeah, good question. So you don't necessarily ever really know. That's part of the point of false discovery rates. You can only assess with some probability. Well, actually, that's not totally true. You can know by repeating the experiment. So if, if I do some big study and I say that sunroofs cause accidents, well, maybe the Highway Safety Commission can repeat the study. They can gather new data. And if they gather new data and that new data doesn't reproduce the same result, then it would cast doubt on my result. But of course, reproducibility is expensive. Okay. So reproducibility is one way they could validate. The other thing, and getting more to our topic if you don't necessarily have the luxury of going and reproducing results and, and rechecking the kinds of things you've tested for, and you can't use something as strict as the Bonferroni correction because you want to test more hypotheses than, you know, than the amount of data you have would admit enough evidence to satisfy that correction, then something like false discovery rate, rates can be a way for you to control and, and limit the number of false conclusions you arrive at or at least control it. So maybe, you know, if you arrive at 100 conclusions, uh, 97 of them are truths. They describe reality, but three are false. They're spurious in some way. And that sounds pretty good to me. Obviously, it varies by application. But if I could learn 97 true things at the consequence of uh, accidentally learning three false things and thinking that they're true when they're not, maybe that's a trade-off that works for my application. So I'm not sure. Can you tell me again what a, what's the trade-off? So uh, maybe let's do an example. Like let's imagine there's a, a group of students and they're being trained as athletes. And you ask them to do a bunch of semi-scientific things like change their diet, change their sleep schedule, listen to their favorite song first thing in the morning, have them do all these different actions. And then at the end of it, you want to say, okay, which of those actions actually improve their athleticism? You can measure before and after. So you can definitely say like, okay, we, we found the improvement. And with a large enough data set, there will always be some correlation. What you want to do is look at all of the correlations you find and rank them from most significant to least significant. This is the high level false discovery rates algorithm. And then you say, well, okay, given the number of tests we ran, we know that we should find a couple of things that seem to be true, even if they're not due to random effects. So then you kind of put this threshold and say, given the number of tests we ran, the strongest one should exceed at least this one high threshold. And the second in line should exceed some threshold. And you have this kind of lining up process that helps you prune through the strongest of the hypotheses that turned out to be true and decide if their strength is appropriate for the level of evidence you have for them. And uh, if it's strong enough, then we'll accept that as a finding. If it's weaker than what we think it should have been, maybe we'll reject that one. Um, that's the process of false discovery rates. Okay, that makes sense. But then what's this, this uh, threshold? Uh, yeah, that's the key question. So that part gets a little complicated, and you kind of have to go into the literature to fully appreciate it. But I think I can pull out the key concept here. So we first have to know about p-values. Are you clear on p-values? Oh, I love it if you remind me. So a p-value is some number that we expect a statistical test to be below. It's the, the standard of evidence. It's that 0 0.05 I mentioned. So if you do some test and you say, well, it looks like people that did A came out better, but you know it, it could be due to chance. That's what you're testing for. 
if the likelihood that it's due to chance is low enough, then we say it's probably a real effect. If you have totally random stuff, you know, just make up random numbers, roll dice or whatever, and you do a bunch of different comparisons, then what you'd expect is you would get uniform p-values. So some p-values would be very high. You know, if you if you look for the correlation between, um, I don't know, uh, how many tomatoes are available at the local grocery store and the Dow Jones Industrial Average, these two things are unrelated. So if you do enough tests like that, you'll just get uniform p-values, some very high, some very low, but flat across the board. That's the expectation for totally unrelated things. However, if two things are actually correlated, if, you know, for some reason, well, in our case of the athletes, you know, trying different things, maybe if you tell athletes to eat in a certain regimented way, that could actually benefit them, could help their metabolism and that sort of thing. So that's probably a real correlated effect. Then the p-values you get there will be distributed differently. They won't be uniform. They'll be stronger near, you know, the low values because you're observing real effects that are there. Now, you don't know which of the effects are real, but we're counting on the fact that truly random data gives you different p-values than not random data. And exploiting that key idea is what gets done in this family of techniques called false discovery rates. So you're trying to figure out what data is random and not random by using this p-value? Yeah, the p-value is our, our standard of evidence. It just tells us, does the result we see does it, is it statistically significant? You know, so you could have a bunch of people do a simple test like the long jump. And if you have some special drink that makes people, claims to make people better at doing the long jump, then uh, of course, you know, you, you give some people the drink and you give some people a placebo drink and you measure how far everybody jumps. Now you're not going to get the exact same measurement, right? Down to the centimeter. The two groups are going to have a different mean. The question is, is that mean statistically significant? So in your, when you're working, you know, on a project, do you call this out to a client? Are you like, I did my P test? I, not exactly those words, but usually yes. Um, there's always a delicate balance here because you deal with some people that know statistics a little bit and some people that don't know it at all. And if you throw around too much jargon, you know, not some people won't appreciate it or understand it. I mean, to me, I always kind of assess, like, are people looking to me for my expertise or for my craftsmanship? So if they just want my expertise, like for me to review the data and tell them the right answer, I will give them the best I know based on my experience. And of course, it's informed by all the statistics. But what I prefer to do is to sort of just be the operator of the statistics and share the results with people and say, you know, you found a result. It is statistically significant, uh, but here are some cautionary tales to consider. Um, and a common one could be making this multiple comparisons fallacy. I used to bump into this a lot early on in my career. People would go on what I call fishing expeditions. They would just keep looking at the data and slice and dice it different ways until something jumps out. And then they'd be like, oh, now I know what we need to do. We need to email men between 40 and 50 only on Wednesdays after 6 p.m. because we get a better conversion rate. And it's like, well, is that relevant or that's just a nonsensical finding because you made enough tests? Is this a question that you ever ask when you're filtering or, or reviewing data presented to you? I'm not necessarily in that situation that often, but absolutely in the cases where I'm you know, being presented someone else's work and being asked to evaluate it, you better believe one of my first questions is, you know, a little bit about their methodology and did they account for multiple comparisons? This is the easiest way to, with best of intentions, make a lot of statistical errors. Okay, so I'm taking notes. So if someone's presenting to me data, I should say, did you account for multiple comparisons? I will ask that. Yep, that's a smart move. Do you feel confident you know how to interpret their answer? No, but I will ask them for help regarding that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, the key thing there is just to know that even if some result is statistically significant, that can be a spurious result if the person didn't follow a really good experimental design. And in a world of big data, it's very easy to not follow good statistical design and good experimental design because, frankly, you can just bang out some quick results with a couple of SQL queries. It's not like going out and having a whole data collection process where you're meticulous at the level that some experimentalist would be. 
Well, yeah, I think that just about covers it. We didn't get in deeply into the methodology. I, I touched on it uh, just briefly, but maybe I'll put some additional notes and references in the show notes for people who want to apply uh, some of the false discovery rate techniques. Truly random data will give you uniform p-values. It will give you 5% false discoveries with a 0.05. You guys can simulate this if you build just a little bit of R or Python code that runs random experiments. It's quite startling how flat the distribution of p-values will be versus real data, which has a totally different shape. And that's something that can be exploited with these techniques. I love it. Well, thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic, where the news may be fake, but the data doesn't lie. Support the show and find extended materials at dataskeptic.com.